I haven't been good lately. I have not been good lately. And it's hard to admit that as a Christian man, but I have truly had to get up and realize what it means to have to put on the full armor of God every day, literally. Because the spiritual forces that are at work in this world right now are getting stronger and they're getting darker. And I mean, it has been a constant battle every day with the onslaught of all the bad news. I mean, we've got people in positions of authority doing evil things to citizens, and we've got citizens in the name of the person that was murdered doing equally reprehensive things, tearing up things, destroying this country, running through the streets like lunatics, and the news media is glorifying it, and that's all you hear about, guys. That's all we hear about. It's a constant onslaught. And about four days ago, I got down on my knees and I cried before God. And I said, Lord, I'm not going to stick my head in the sand, but I cannot listen to this garbage anymore. I have to get into your word, Father. I have to see what you say about hope and future. You see, we all know what Jeremiah 29, 11 says. It says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you hope and a future. To prosper you. But guys, I want to tell you something. God's plans for us were written before we were born. Paul, if you'd bring up Psalm 139, 16. It says, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. See, folks, we all have an assignment book. And it's assigned to us before we're formed, before we're put into our mother's womb. And we're going to be held accountable as to whether or not we live according to that assignment book. We have to fulfill what God has for us. <clears throat> and you know, years ago, for many years, I worked with Frida's husband, my brother-in-law, Herman. And Herman was a wonderful Christian man, but I'm going to tell you something. On the job site, he was a hard taskmaster. But he didn't ask you to work any harder than he was willing to work himself as the lead and he didn't accept any excuses about why the job wasn't done, about why you couldn't come to work on time. You'd start laying out these excuses and he'd say, oatmeal. He said, why don't you just come in and tell me oatmeal because that's, that's all it is. It's just excuses. And, and none of it was any more acceptable than oatmeal. <laughs> and I want to ask you something, folks. Do you think that if we don't fulfill God's will for our life when it's time to stand before him, do you think any excuse is going to fly? It won't. See, God had a plan for Abraham to become the patriarch of his people. And... We read in Genesis 12, 2, starting with verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What did he tell Abram to do right up front? Get you out of your land. Some translation says, get into a foreign land. Where was Abram's blessings at? They were in that foreign land. If Abram would have sat right there where he was at, all the peoples of the earth wouldn't have been blessed through Abram. Abram had to do what God said to do to get there. <clears throat> And just like Abram, 
God has plans for us. See, we always read Jeremiah 29, 11 in the vein of we want to be blessed. Lord, bless me. Bless my family's lives. But let me tell you something, folks. God doesn't bless any of us so we can sit on our fat, blessed insurance behinds and be blessed. He blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. And you know, I'm, I've recently met a pastor from Eagle Lake, his name's C.W. Huffman. And C.W. Huffman preached a message about two weeks ago. And if you ever watch this, C.W., I'm going to steal your line from your sermon. His, the name of his sermon was the Nike uh, motto, just do it. When God tells you to do something, stop with all the excuses. Just do it. Yeah, it's hard. You know, buckle up your shoes. Buckle up them Nikes. Put on your armor of God and just do what he tells you to do. You know, <laughs> Brother C.W. said there was an old man who had jogged 17 miles every day all of his life. And he said he got to be like 75 years old and he was still out there jogging at 17 miles. And somebody caught up with him and said, Hey, old man, how do you... Keep your teeth from chattering at this age when you're running. He said, I'll leave them in the locker. <clears throat> you know, my sister Lisa Heitman used a video when she spoke on Wednesday night it's been a few months ago now. It's before this quarantine set in. But it was, it was a very effective tool. And part of what brought this message about was uh, a friend of mine came through town and he wanted to show me uh, a couple of America's Got Talent videos of two people that were amazing t uh, uh, contestants. They were unique and they were amazing. And uh, so here in a little bit, I'm going to show you both of those. But before I show you that one, I want you to bear with me. And I'm going to show you this first video. And most of you know who he is. He played at A&M. His name was Johnny Manziel. Okay? For those of you that don't like football, bear with me. I, I'm making a point here. Johnny Manziel in my humble opinion, was one of the two or three greatest college football players that I think ever played the game. And as you could see on a college level, he did anything he wanted to do anytime he wanted to do it. And he did the same thing all the way through high school. And it, and it was that way in college. He's the only person to ever win the Heisman Trophy as a freshman. The only one in the history of college football. And Every time he was going to play, I tuned in. It's the first time in years that I made a point to tune in to watch a, uh, any one individual player. But when I think about that young man now, all I feel is sadness. Because you see, he never faced any adversity. He worked hard to get where he was at, obviously. But he never faced any adversity until he was drafted into the pros. And he was drafted by the Cleveland Browns, and he began to work as he always had worked. And the owner of the team and the head coach both chimed in and said, I don't know what this guy is doing. We drafted this guy to be a backup quarterback. He needs to start acting like a backup. And not only did he start acting like a backup, he didn't even act like a backup. Because, see, a, a true backup prepares itself to be ready when the starter goes down. Manziel began to sulk, began to say, what the heck, I, no matter how hard I work, they're not going to do anything. They're not going to let me play. And he got into a party lifestyle. And whenever the starter did get hurt and he put in, he looked like, got put in in pros at a higher level of competition, he looked like a fool. And shortly after that, he got cut. And 
tried to play in the Canadian Football League and got cut from the Canadian Football League. And now <laughs> nobody wants him. Not the XFL, not nobody. So see, here is a guy who was blessed with everything in life. And what did he do with it? I want to read to y'all. Uh, we all know the parable of the talents, but I want to read it to you in a little bit different light this morning. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. We all know who the man traveling to the far country is. It's Jesus. And he delivered all of his goods to us to accomplish his will. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one he gave to each of them according to their ability. Because see, he knows our abilities. And immediately he who went on a journey, see, he's gone to be with the Father. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's left behind his goods, the things that he went. He took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He gave us the Holy Spirit, everything we need to be successful for him. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received the one went and dug in the ground and, did his, and hid his Lord's money. That's, uh, that's those servants who take their light and hide it under a bushel. We're supposed to take that light and set it on a lampstand for all the world to see. So he who had received five talents came and brought five more talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well, don't we want to hear that when we stand before Jesus? He who had also received the two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more besides them. And his Lord said to him, Well done. Good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he, he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, and this guy, before, before I read it, he's got the Adam syndrome, the blame game. When God came to Adam and said, What have you done? Have you eaten of the tree? He said, well, this woman that you did give me, she gave to me, and I did eat. So it's your fault, God. If you wouldn't have given her to me, I wouldn't have done anything wrong. But here's this servant, and he says, Then he who had received the one said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. I'm going to stop right there. See, I never got this part. He paid the price on the cross. He left some of us to scatter the seed and some to reap. But who are we doing it for? Are we doing it for us? Or are we doing it for the one who paid the price? And yes, Jesus is a hard taskmaster in that, in that, what excuse should Jesus accept for many of us having paid the price he paid? Reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. He did absolutely nothing with what the Lord gave him. Nothing. I'm going to ask each one of you, I want you to 
think about it and ask yourself, what has the Lord given me? What has he given me? What can I do with what the Lord's given me? But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered. So you ought to have deposited my money in the bank. At my coming, I would have at least received interest on it. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and, him, and he will have an abundance from him who has not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. That's pretty tough, isn't it, guys? I just got to say, though, I, I understand Jesus' point of view. What a horrible price he paid for us. What a wonderful gift. And he deserves all we have. He deserves everything we have. You may not think you have anything. The, the smallest little gift you have. And see, talents was a measure of money. Okay? But it, isn't it ironic how it also stands for those gifts and skills that the Lord bestows upon each one of us and he expects us to use them for his honor. If you can play a guitar, he don't want you in a nightclub in a beer joint somewhere playing rock and roll music and getting drunk. He wants you to play it for the, his glory. If you can bake cakes, cookies, Lisa, <laughs> he wants you to honor him with that. I promise you, if you honor the Lord with your gift, he will multiply it many times over. Because it says right here, it's his principle. To who have been, has been given, it'd be more will be given to him if he uses it, if he's faithful with it. And I don't know if y'all like, I know intellectual people like this kind of stuff, but some people just think it's jarring, but bear with me a few minutes. And I'm going to read these in reverse order. You know, in the Bible it gave the guy with five and then two and then one. But just so we can understand what was given, okay? One talent equaled approximately 6,000 Roman denarius. And by today's standards, silver weight, it equaled $21,720. By today's standards. In Jesus' time, one denarius was one day's wage, or $20 a day, times 6000 is $120,000 in that day, is what he gave the guy with one talent. And you can multiply that by each one. The one that was given two was given 240000 and the one that was given five was given 600000 And guess what? He brought back... The one with five brought back five more. That equals $1,200,000 that he brought back to his master. The one brought the two brought back 480000 And of course, the one that was given one just brought back one. So what I'm saying here, the reason I brought that up and thought it was important, is because you say, man, that guy just got one. He didn't give him much to work with. Even he who was given little was given plenty. He was given plenty to have done something with. You don't think $120,000 that day was plenty enough to do something with it? There's no excuses. God gives us each according to our abilities. And as you apply yourself in Him and your ability increases, He will multiply those gifts to you. But God is only faithful to those who prove faithful to Him. I mean, He only multiplies. He's always faithful. Excuse me for misstating that. But... He can only bless you when you're faithful in what he gives you. The other scripture that tied right in with this was Luke 12, 47 48. It said, And that servant that knew his master's will and did not pre prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. 
But he who did not know yet committed these things deserving of strife will be beaten with you. For every one to whom much is given, much of him is required. When the Lord blesses you, blesses us with much, much is required of us. Roberta, can you see me? Can you hear me? You walked in here, didn't you, Lisa? And I see you writing notes over there so your arms and hands work. Let me tell you something, guys. That's an amazing blessing. Because I can't tell you how many people in this world are born without vision or hearing or the ability to speak or walk or use their arms. Man, we've already been blessed beyond what we realize. And what Jesus wants us using these blessings for, folks, is the fact that, as we've been watching on the news lately, there is a world full of lunacy going on. There are people dying and going to hell. They are running amok under the power and the authority of Satan. And don't get me wrong, I would not dare equate those who are peacefully protesting something that was wrong to this. I'm talking about the lunatics that are joining in and attaching themselves to these people and committing these acts. The mission field is in the street, folks. The mission is out there. Pastor Tim says it all the time. We cannot save people inside here. Most everybody that walks in here knows Jesus. The people on the streets are dying. And in John 4, 35, it says, Do not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest. For behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages, and he who gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and yet you have entered into their labors. It all ties in, folks. The master said, I reap where I have not sown. Jesus didn't go everywhere and sow everywhere. That's our jobs. We're his feet. We're his legs. We're his mouth. We're his arms extended to those that are down and out. And that's what the blessings are for, folks. God doesn't want us to pray and ask for blessings so that we can be blessed. He wants us to use those talents that he gave us, both money, monetary-wise, and gift-wise. Don't say you don't have anything. God doesn't send anybody down here empty-handed. Brother, play that next video. I'm going to prove to you what God can do. And some of you may have already seen these, but I won't, when I was watching this, it got all over me, and it just made me say, Lord, if they can do this with this much, how much should I be doing? I hope those videos inspired you the way they did me but I got one question for everybody in this room what excuse do any of us have you just saw an autistic blind boy and a boy with cancer pronounced on him when he was four years old and I know Simon Cowell isn't Jesus and that gold buzzer isn't the ticket into heaven but I want to hear Jesus stand up and say I just got one thing to say to Satan and all those who, who tried to trample you underfoot. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Yes. If any of you need to know or want to pray and ask God to help you discover what it is that he has for you to do or what your talent is, I'm here to pray with you. I'd ask John to come up and pray with me and Tammy and Tawana if, if y'all want to. If anybody would like prayer for God's 
to download what it is that he has for you to do in that assignment book or what it is that your talent is that you can serve him with with all your heart. I'm just going to open up the front if you'd like to come up and get prayer. Thank you, brother. How you doing, Brother Benny? Father God, I just thank you for my brother Benny, Lord. Lord God, I just lift him up to you, Father.